my friends, and welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosity Test Kitchen, where this week we are attempting an authentic mid-19th century Victorian Christmas recipe. There were many, many household manuals and recipe books published between about 1800 and 1900, but for this experiment we are going to be using the one, the only, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management. Running to over 1,000 pages, Mrs. Beaton's was published in 1861 and contains instructions for every single aspect of Victorian housekeeping, including management of multiple servants, home nursing, child rearing, and instructions on landlord-tenant relations, right down to how to purchase a house. What with all this breadth of information, many would picture the author as a sturdy, middle-aged lady with 11 children and years of domestic experience under her belt. But actually, Isabella Mary Beaton was only 25 when the handbook was published and died of childbed fever four years later. She may also have had syphilis, which adds an interesting twist to her reputation as a paragon of domestic bliss. She had also likely never even attempted most of the 2,000 recipes in the book herself. But despite all that, Mrs. Beaton sold two million copies in seven years and quickly became a household touchstone for generations of housewives. Today, we are going to be making a Christmas plum pudding, recipe number 1,328. Now, there are many, many Christmas pudding recipes in the world, and the spices and some of the ingredients and flavorings vary wildly, but most of them come down to four basic things. Breadcrumbs, eggs, dried fruit, and this. This is suet. Now, suet is fat, specifically the hard fat found around the kidneys and lurines of cows and sheep. It's denser and harder than regular animal fat. It has a higher melting point than lard or butter. And as you can see, it's been vacuum packed and refrigerated. And that is because unlike lard, which has been rendered and can be stored at room temperature, this is fresh suet which means that it goes rancid very, very quickly if it's kept at room temperature for longer than a couple of days. I'm going to cut it open. So it's got a very odd texture. It's kind of crumbly compared to regular fat. You can see it sort of comes apart in little pieces. Suet was a very common Victorian and pre-modern ingredient. It was used in all sorts of things, but because it had such a high melting point, it was also used in hair grease and pomade and ointments and lotions, machine lubricant, all sorts of things. It's not used very much anymore, and that is because of this. So you can see, suet is full of tiny little membranes. If you were a Victorian housewife, you would get your suet fresh, and then you would have to go in and you would have to pick out all of these little membranes. Ooh, it's so crumbly. God, look at it. It's like a vegan's nightmare. As you can imagine, picking the bits out of the suet was a very time-consuming task, which is why it was often left to servants. And while we're doing it, why don't we talk about Christmas pudding and why it's called Christmas pudding. And plum puddings were traditionally eaten throughout the harvest period, all the way through from the fall to the early spring. If you had something to celebrate, you would have celebrated it with a plum pudding because it was a good, nutritious meal to eat in the middle of winter time. It had lots of fat, it had lots of dried fruit in it. Dried fruit was available in the winter time. It was full of calories and it would keep you going and it also kept really really well. And the first person to call them a Christmas pudding was in fact our good friend Mr. Christmas himself, Chucky e. D. In A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens lovingly describes Mrs. Cratchit's plum pudding, which in the story is kind of a symbol of domesticity and family and Christmas and making do with very little but still being happy, etc, etc, etc. That was the first mention of it being called a Christmas pudding. All right, now that we have our suet chopped into tiny pieces and that my hands, even after I washed them, are covered in a fine layer of congealed animal kidney fat, so smooth. 
to put this into the bowl, and then I'm going to add the rest of my dry ingredients. So the dry ingredients include one pound of currants, one pound of stoned raisins, this means raisins that have had their seeds removed, one half pound of sliced candied peel, this is actually slightly less than half a pound, but I'm sure the ghost of Mrs. Beaton will not haunt me for this. One teaspoon of dried ground ginger and half of a nutmeg. In good old Mrs. Beaton's day, you would buy your nutmeg in the shape of a nut. You would buy it in its solid form and then you would grate it up into tiny little pieces, which is where we get the nutmeg powder from. I'm gonna put that in there. Three quarters of a pound of breadcrumbs. Now, as you can see, my breadcrumbs are brown breadcrumbs because that is the kind of bread that I had in my house. The Victorians would have scoffed at my brown breadcrumbs. If you were a Victorian, white bread was associated with high class people. Brown bread was for the poor and peasants, and it had been like that since the Middle Ages. You wanted your bread as white and fluffy and processed as possible, even if it meant that you were slightly malnourished and you couldn't poop. So, in go my common peasant breadcrumbs. Now, you may have noticed we've got a lot of things in here. One of the things that we don't have is a plum. That's because the word plum just meant a dried fruit of any kind. So, raisins, currants count as plums. So now I'm going to mix all of my dried ingredients together with my tiny but mighty spoon. Eight eggs well beaten. Oh man, tweed was a poor choice. I'm going to add those in. One wine glass full of brandy. That may seem like a lot of brandy, but that's because our wine glasses are about five times the size of a standard Victorian wine glass. Standard size modern wine glass is about this big, but a Victorian wine glass was about this big. And an 18th century wine glass could be this big. That's still quite a bit. She did say a wine glass full of brandy. So I'm just following the instructions. In we go. Now I'm going to stir this all together into a delicious Christmas pudding slurry. So traditionally, you would make your Christmas pudding on Stir Up Sunday, which was about five weeks before Christmas. It was the last Sunday before Advent. Everyone in the family would get a chance to stir the Christmas pudding mixture. And you would stir it clockwise, which was the same direction as the sun and is the lucky direction. And then you would make a wish. Of course, you didn't want to stir it counterclockwise, because that's inviting bad luck. That's Wittershins. You don't want to do Wittershins. I can see why you would want to divide up the labor of mixing your Christmas pudding amongst as many members of your family as possible, because it is heavy. It's kind of like mixing delicious, fruity, brandy-scented asphalt. Now that we have our mixture suitably well combined, like this, we are going to contain our pudding. And we're going to do it two ways. One in a cloth and one in a mold. Way back in the medieval period, you would have used something like a sheep's stomach or a pig's stomach or a pig's intestines to hold your delicious, delicious pudding. And nowadays, of course, we still have things like black pudding and hegges, which are kind of like living fossils that have come down to us from the medieval period. Then in the 16th century, somebody discovered that you could just use an ordinary piece of muslin cloth like this, and you didn't have to worry about sheep stomachs anymore. And that was probably a good day, I'm thinking. The good old fashioned pudding cloth was still used by the Victorians and is still used by some people today. You put flour all over the cloth, you put the mixture in it, you just drop it into the hot water. And that's where you get that nice cannonball shaped perfectly round Christmas pudding that you see on Christmas cards and in old Victorian illustrations of Christmas. But if you are a fancy middle-class housewife like Mrs. Beaton, 
you would use a mold like this. The Victorians loved molds. They loved them so much. Look at any Victorian cookbook or any Victorian illustration of a dinner party of the era and you will see dozens of things that look kind of like this. This is actually a fairly simple mold. They got wild. Anything that could be shaped into a tiny fortress of food, the Victorians would mold it. I have my pudding cloths. Ha 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 ha! They have been dipped into boiling water. So you can see this one. I don't know if you can see the steam rising off of these, but they're very hot. They're still slightly damp. And now what I have to do is cover every inch of these cloths with flour. What I'm actually doing is I'm mixing the starch of the flour with the water in the cloth, and it's forming a kind of a paper mache paste, if you will. A starchy sort of barrier, and I want to get it all over every inch of my cloth. So while we're here, and while we're rubbing flour into this cloth, let's talk about flour. And the Victorian era was the beginning of industrialized food manufacturing. People didn't personally know for the first time, the people who were making their food. They were just purchasing it the way that we do today, and this was new. And so this distance meant that a lot of processed foods were adulterated with cheaper alternatives. The flour in bread was padded out with things like chalk dust, plaster of Paris, ground up bean flour, mashed potato, or even sawdust. But the most popular adulterant was this. Now this is potassium aluminum sulfate, or alum. It's got a crystalline structure, so it doesn't really feel like flour, but they added this to flour very regularly. One of the reasons was because it made cheap flour look whiter. And as we mentioned before, the Victorians loved white bread. It also retains water easily, so it made the bread heavier, which meant that you could charge more for a loaf of bread that was full of alum than one that was actually made of real flour. In 1871, it was found that about half of the bread sold in London was adulterated with alum. And it wasn't just flour. They also used to add lead chromate to mustard. Lead in, they used to put lead in wine to make it taste sweeter. They used to add copper sulfate to pickles to improve the color. And they used to add iron filings and dust and all sorts of things to tea leaves and then they would dye it black. Milk was also adulterated, it was watered down, and then chalk was added to make it thicker. Luckily for us, we now have things like food inspections and regulations, which hopefully make sure that our flour is not full of sawdust and our milk is not full of chalk. So that's something to be thankful for this Christmas season. Now that I have my mold, I'm going to butter every tiny inch of this mold because I want to make sure that it's not going to stick to the inside. Especially the little knobbly bits on the top. The knobbly bits are very important to the Christmas season. Now that I have my mold ready, I'm going to put my pudding mixture in. And I'm just going to use my hand. Errant raisin. Ooh, it's so suety. Smushed it down thoroughly. Now I need to put a waterproof layer over the top. So I'm going to take my, full, my lovely flowered pudding cloth. And I'm going to put it over the top. And then I take a piece of string. Good solid string. I'm going to loop it around the edge of the mold. I'm going to tie it down so that it's nice and tight. There we go. And then we're going to flip up the ends of our cloth. I'm going to tie them into little knots. And this is going to make a nice little handle with which we can lift our pudding out of the boiling water later. I'm going to take my molded pudding, I'm going to put it in this pot. And then I'm going to fill the pot with boiling water about halfway up the sides of the pudding. Then I'm going to boil it for approximately four hours. Here I have my second pudding cloth. 
this one I really thoroughly floured because this one is just going into the pot on its own. Dun dun dun! So I take my cloth, flip it over to the non floury side, and now I'm just going to scoop the mixture into the middle of the pudding cloth. I'm going to shape it into a big lump. And now I'm going to gather the pudding cloth up at the top. I want it to be like a pair of badly designed women's jeans. No pockets and no room to move. And then I'm going to tie it around the top. In A Christmas Carol, Mrs. Cratchit actually cooks her pudding in the copper in the backyard, which is not actually a cooking implement. The copper was a communal copper pot used for boiling laundry. I will see you in four hours. All right, so it's been four hours of boiling, and now we have our two Christmas puddings. I'm going to very carefully cut the string Oh, it's so glutinous. Okay. We have one cannonball shaped Christmas pudding. Hopefully, this turns out. It is also very glutinous. Mm. We just have to get it out of the mold. There we have our two Christmas puddings, our cannonball, and our Pudding Palace, which appears to be having some structural issues, but is still generally mold-shaped. And now, for our special finale, we are going to do the thing that turns an ordinary plum pudding into a real Christmas pudding. We are going to douse it in alcohol, and we're going to set it on fire. In A Christmas Carol, Mrs. Cratchit douses her plum pudding with half of half a quartern of lighted brandy, which is approximately this much brandy. I'll get the lights. And there we have it. Merry Christmas, everyone, from the Fernie Museum.